สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our Pali Canon and English Study Group, where we study the words of the Buddha. In this book series titled "The Words of the Buddha: The Path to Enlightenment, Revealing the Hidden," we're in Volume 10, which is titled "The Buddha's Way." We're going to be exploring chapters 41 through 46 today. And the way that we structure our class is we start out with a brief meditation just to prepare the mind for study. And then after the meditation, a student will volunteer to read each one of the chapters as we progress in our class. After the chapter is read, I will share some teachings with you related to that specific chapter and then open up to any questions that you have. This program, the Pali Canon in English Study Group, is based on volumes 2 through volumes 13 of this book series. And you can download the books by going to buddhadailywisdom.com and there you'll see a link for free books. And if you're joining us for the very first time, that's wonderful because we'll actually be reading the chapters and you can study along with us. But if you would like to then join us for future classes and prepare ahead of time, you can actually read the chapters prior to class because the chapters will have the words of the Buddha. There's a reference for you to go back to the original Pali Canon or the original source text. And then there's explanations of things that I'm sharing with you as a teacher to help you understand further be, uh, related to what the Buddha is actually sharing. His teachings are very clear, very precise, very concise, but it's also helpful to have someone who's spent time with the text to share their thoughts on what the Buddha is actually teaching to help you along in your journey on this path to enlightenment. Because all of this study and all of this growth is to help you get to this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy where the mind is no longer experiencing any discontent feelings. So I'd like to welcome all of you, whether you're joining us for the first time or you've been joining us regularly, whether you're listening to this live now and you're joining the class live, or whether you're listening to this on a replay, I'd like to welcome all of you and also invite you to join for meditation. So if you'd like to take a position, either seated, standing, or lying, you can take a meditation position and get the lower body comfortable. And the hands and arms should just rest comfortably in the lap. I'll just give you some basic guidance here in order to help you because most students who join this particular program are more developed in their practice so they don't tend to need as much guidance and plus our meditation is pretty short here so we don't usually do as much guidance with your lower body and your hands and arms nice and comfortable the upper body should be erect this keeps the mind attentive and alert during your meditation so Keep your upper body nice and erect during the meditation and then just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. I'm going to do some chanting to ease us into meditation. You're welcome to join along in these chants if you're familiar with them. Ah. Uh-huh. 
Breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Nice, gradual, natural breaths at your own pace. Your breath isn't going to necessarily match up to the guidance that I provide. Breathing in. In, out. Start fixating the mind on the sound of the breath or the sensation of the air moving into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. In, out. With the mind fixated on the sound of the breath or the sensation of air moving into the nose, wherever you observe a thought coming into the mind, just cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to judge the thought, analyze it, label it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Just focus the mind on the breath and wherever you notice that the mind is not on the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in, in, out.
Alright, if you guys would like to slowly make your way out of meditation, we'll just kind of switch over and start to study the words of the Buddha using volume 10, starting with chapter 41. What I'm going to do is just turn things over to all of you, specifically Miranda and Manal, to guide us through the class where students will read each chapter. I'll share some teachings on that and then open up to any questions that you guys might have. In order to ask questions, you can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Into the comment section, the moderators will see that and be sure your question gets asked during the class. Or if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. Uh, chapter 41. Wisdom, mindfulness, name and form stopped by the stopping of consciousness. Wisdom and mindfulness, said Venerable Ajita, and name and form, sir. Tell me this when asked, where is this stopped? I shall answer this question which you have asked, Ajita, where name and form is completely stopped by the stopping of consciousness, there it is stopped. All right. Thank you, Miranda. So here there's a student asking the Buddha a question, which is how teachers will typically teach is that they don't just push their teachings onto other people, but they allow the students to ask questions. And it's through the questions that they ask that the teacher is then able to reply. And also it gives some insight into the student's mind and what they're thinking about and what it is that they're working on in their practice. And the teacher is then able to more readily help them by students actually asking questions. So here, this particular student is asking the Buddha about wisdom and mindfulness in this name and form. You know, where is this stopped? What name and form is, is name and form is described in dependent origination by the Buddha 
as essentially the physical body and the mind coming together for this existence. He gives exact details of what this is, which is essentially the five aggregates with um, a contact in there as well. So essentially what it is, is it's the physical body and the mind coming together. Essentially what this student is asking is, you know, how do you essentially stop the cycle of rebirth and how do you end this cycle of rebirth and what the buddha ultimately gets to is he says by stopping consciousness that is where it is stopped so that's where the cycle of rebirth is stopped is by ending this continuous uh, new existence by purifying the consciousness by training the mind that's how you ultimately get to enlightenment and once you get to enlightenment you will have eliminated all discontentedness and all rebirth is eliminated so it's wisdom that it helps to transform the mind and of course you would need to have mindfulness or awareness of mind as well in order to get to that point so it's training the mind developing the consciousness eliminating the pollutions of mind specifically the 10 fetters that then with a purified mind it will no longer experience discontentedness and then there will no longer be any rebirth the constant cycle of rebirth the mind is still polluted the being hasn't done the work they haven't learned the teachings they haven't been exposed to the teachings in a way that will help them to ultimately get to enlightenment and end the cycle of rebirth so the reason why all of us are still existing in this form of human is because in our previous lives we did not yet get to enlightenment but here in this life we have this opportunity to learn reflect and practice getting to enlightenment, observing the condition of the mind gradually improving, and then you'll know, having eliminated all discontentedness, that there will no longer be any rebirth, because the Buddha is saying that you've stopped consciousness, there's no more furthering of consciousness, because it's craving, desire, attachment, that the Buddha describes as the fuel that leads to the next rebirth. And the way you can think about this is if there's a fire that's burning and the logs are the fuel and it's you know spitting off sparks into the forest those sparks are going to land on a new pile of leaves and it's going to spark a new fire well it's the same thing as if there's craving desire attachment in the mind by the time of death that yearning that longing is going to spark a new existence but when you eliminate the fuel when there's no more logs in the fire and the fire has been put out, then there's no more sparks that are going to be able to light the next fire. So the same thing is when you extinguish the fires of craving, anger, and ignorance, then there's no more spark to be able to create the next fire or the next existence. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear we have any more ch or any questions at this time, sir. All right, so we'll move to chapter 42. Yes, sir, let's go to Jan to read chapter 42, sir. Thank you, Miranda. Without clinging, one attains Nibbana. Here, Ananda, a monk is practicing thus. If it were not, it would not be mine. It will not be, and it will not be mine. What exists, what has come to be, that I am abandoning. Thus he obtains equanimity. He does not seek excitement in that equanimity, welcome it, or remain holding on to it. Since he does not do so, his consciousness does not become dependent on it and does not cling to it. A monk Ananda, who is without clinging, attains Nibbana, enlightenment. All right, thanks, Jan. There's a couple of things in this short little passage here, this excerpt from the Pali Canon that we can talk about. First, let's talk about equanimity. Equanimity is uh, evenness of mind, calmness, composure, evenness of temper, especially in difficult situations. There's another component to equanimity too, which is treating all beings equally and fairly. But let's just focus in on this quality of mind of equanimity where the mind is calm and composed, evenness of temper. Well, this is what an enlightened being is going to have, among many other qualities. They will have cultivated this in their practice. And here, what the Buddha is explaining is that, you know, even an enlightened being should not seek excitement in the equanimity, right? Because by clinging even to something wholesome like equanimity, then the mind can actually, or the mind is discontent. Because if you're seeking excitement, the mind is longing and yearning, wanting this 
equanimity, then when it doesn't have it, it's going to be discontent. And when it has it, then it has these pleasant feelings that have arisen. So what you do is you cultivate all these various qualities of mind, bringing the mind to the middle, where you see the calmness and the composure coming into the mind, but you don't excite in it. And then if you don't excite in it, then also you won't have painful feelings when it's not there. But more and more by training in that way, it will be there all the time because an enlightened being is going to always have equanimity. In all situations, you're going to see an enlightened being is calm, composed, evenness of temper. Their mind's not going to fluctuate and go up and down. So not just equanimity, but all these wholesome qualities like loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, uh, concentration, mindfulness, all of these and others. If the mind is clinging to these wholesome qualities, then uh, the mind is going to experience discontentedness. The other aspect here that the Buddha is talking about at the beginning, he's saying, if it were not, it would not be mine. Essentially, what he's describing here is that nothing in this world is yours. Nothing belongs to you. Um, because if you hold on and you cling to anything, whether it's this computer, whether it's these clothes, this microphone, whether it's material possessions or relationships, anything that you cling to, then the mind is going to be discontent. So you've got to be able to see that, okay, I'm using this computer or I'm using these clothes or I'm using this car, I'm using this house, but none of this stuff is mine. It doesn't belong to me. I'm going to take care of it while I'm using it because yeah, it's impermanent, but I'm not interested in it being more impermanent than it already is. So let me maintain it. Let me take care of it. Let me practice that middle way and ensuring that I have these things for myself to be able to use. But if I cling to it and want it to be permanent, there's going to be discontentedness there because it's not permanent. And it's only a matter of time before that's gone. And then when it's gone, the mind's going to experience these painful feelings. So what you'd like to do is get to the middle where you can practice understanding that all these things that you have and all these things that are around you and that you're using, they're not yours, they don't belong to you. And in this way, the mind can then reside in the middle and not be dependent on these, right? So here the Buddha says, since he does not do so, his consciousness does not become dependent on it and does not cling to it, right? Because if there's clinging, then there's continuation of consciousness. But without clinging, then one attains nibbana, this enlightened mental state where the mind's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. As long as the mind's holding on and holding on and holding on, things aren't going to be your way. They're not going to be permanent. So therefore, it's only a matter of time before the mind is shaken up when those things don't exist. So by letting go and realizing that you're using these things, but they're not yours, they don't belong to you, they're not permanent, then the mind can reside at ease when the impermanence comes to visit you on anything that you're experiencing. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Uh, yes, sir. Just to double check the understanding of this. Even when we are trying to arise wholesome mental states and maintain them, we need to be mindful that we're not clinging to those wholesome mental states. So if they are not present at some point, we don't become discontent. Is that kind of the understanding here, sir? Yes, because if you're clinging to something like equanimity, when you have equanimity, you're going to have this excitement. You're going to have those conditioned pleasant feelings because your pleasant feelings are conditioned on having equanimity. And then when equanimity is not there, it's not present, then there's going to be these conditioned painful feelings. And in that situation, the mind is still basing itself on some impermanent condition. So therefore, it's not going to experience the permanent peacefulness of enlightenment. So you don't allow the mind to base its inner feelings on some impermanent conditions, like whether there's equanimity there or not. Because what you're going to experience as the mind evolves and gets closer and closer to enlightenment is you'll see these various wholesome qualities that will be present in the mind and for a period of time, maybe a few hours, a few days, a few weeks, even a few months. But then something will occur in your life where craving will arise and then the equanimity will be gone, for example. 
And in that situation, even if it's gone for five minutes or 20 minutes or a day or two, then you're going to experience not only the shaking up of the mind because the equanimity is not there, but you're going to experience the painful feelings as well. So getting to the point where you realize that, okay, I've got equanimity. Okay, great. I'm going to keep practicing equanimity. And wherever you see that it's not there, then you just apply the practice to bring the mind back to equanimity rather than experience the pleasant f feelings when you have equanimity therefore you're not going to experience those when there's no equanimity i.e you're going to have painful feelings instead you just observe okay there's equanimity there okay fine let me just keep practicing equanimity oh equanimity is gone okay what do i need to do to arise equanimity let me calm down let me slow down let me take things at a more even pace and let me bring the mind back to equanimity rather than feel deflated or depleted when equanimity is not there you just take action in order to bring the mind back to equanimity yes thank you sir you're welcome and it does not appear there are any more questions at this time all right so we'll go to chapter 43 uh, yes, let's go to Manal to read chapter 43, sir. By not clinging, they are freed. Clinging, they look upon with fear, for it produces birth and death. And by not clinging, they are freed. In the destruction of birth and death, they reside in joy, for they are safe, and reach nirvana, enlightenment here and now. They are beyond all fear and hate. They have escaped all discontentedness. All right. Thank you, Mar or thank you, Manal. Um, yeah, so here again, a very short excerpt from the Pali Canon, but there's a lot of information in this short little uh, uh, excerpt here. So here the Buddha explains that if there's clinging, there's going to be fear, right? Because we know that it's craving, desire, attachment, wants, expectations, clinging, all of this mental longing and strong eagerness and holding on to things really tightly that is going to produce all discontentedness, including fear. So if there's fear in your mind, it's because the mind's holding on to something. So let's just say somebody's uh, fearful of uh, ants or fearful of frogs, for example. Then they're clinging to perhaps this physical body or perhaps they're clinging or holding on to some experience they had in the past. And because the mind is clinging and holding on to something, it's conditioned, it's experiencing this fear arising whenever it sees frogs or whenever it sees ants, for example. And because of that clinging, because of the craving, desire, attachment, it's going to continue to produce birth and death. Because there's going to be these continuous rebirths in the cycle of rebirth, a being who has craving by the end of their life is going to experience rebirth in some realm of existence of the five realms. And as long as we're in this cycle of rebirth, experiencing birth and death, birth and death, there's continuous displeasure, despair, misery, grief, sorrow, and all these other discontent feelings. And by not clinging, they are freed. So by eliminating craving, desire, attachment, wants, expectations, clinging, this is where the mind then becomes free. It's no longer burdened. It's no longer experiencing this discontentedness due to the craving or clinging that's in the mind. And that's the condition that's causing the discontentedness to arise. In the destruction of birth and death, they reside in joy. This is where the joy of the enlightened mind is starting to arise. You get these glimpses of joy and the mind is safe. Oftentimes we think that it's a weapon that's going to keep us safe or it's a building or a dwelling or, uh, you know, running away and being in a remote place is going to somehow keep us safe. But that's not what actually keeps us safe. What keeps us safe is our wise decisions. By making wise decisions, then that ensures our safety. But we can't make wise decisions as fully when there's craving, anger, and ignorance in the mind. So by eliminating the pollution of mind, now there's this brilliance or this brightness or this radiance. There's this ability to now make wise decisions about every aspect of your life. And then you can function in a very wholesome way and experience lots of wholesome outcomes as part of the decisions that you're making. And this is where the mind can be joyful. 
Because if you can imagine all the times that you've been sorryful or miserable or grief stricken or having displeasure or despair or other feelings like this, whenever that's occurred, the mind isn't experiencing joy. But eliminating craving and clinging where you're wanting things to be a certain way with this mental longing and strong eagerness, then the mind can always be joyful because you can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy in any situation. There's nothing, one particular thing that you want or that you don't want that this agreeable and disagreeable has diminished and eliminated from the mind because there's no craving that's producing the agreeable and disagreeable thoughts in your mind. Instead, there's just, oh, I would prefer to do that. Oh, I can't do that. Okay, well, I'll do this other thing. Oh, I can't do that too. Okay, well, I'll just sit here and relax then. Then the mind can be joyful in any and all situations and reach enlightenment or nibbana here and now. And then a enlightened being will be beyond fear and hate. They will no longer have any fear or any hate among other uh, unwholesome qualities of mind that will all have been eliminated. They have escaped all discontentedness. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Uh, Manal has her hand raised. Let's go to her for a question. Thanks, Miranda. Teacher David, um, we can speak towards clinging and craving and longing. Are those a part of volitional formation? The craving and clinging is not part of volitional formations, but they pollute our volitional formations. So if you remember back to dependent origination, those are separate things where there's ignorance, then there's volitional formations, then there's consciousness and so forth and so on. And then in the middle, there's craving and clinging, which are separate things. But when there's craving and clinging in the mind, these are pollutions or conditions that are affecting our volitional formation. So someone with craving for money, for example, they're going to make decisions and motivate it out of this greed or out of this longing and yearning for money or all the other things that we could potentially crave in our life. i just give you that one as an example. And when we make decisions based on our own selfish desires, like wanting a lot of money, then our decisions are tainted with our own selfish desires and they oftentimes uh, erupt and blow up in our face. They blow up in our life and we don't experience the wholesome outcomes that we could experience if we still pursued money as a way of sustaining our life and the needs that we have in our life, but not out of longing and yearning. When we have this longing and yearning, we might cut corners, we might lie, we might tell untruths, we, we might uh, do backhanded things. We might gossip about people in order to get it what we want in terms of a promotion or a certain income. And then ultimately, even if we get the objects of our affection, that's temporary. And now we've had to kind of tromp all over a whole lot of people in order to get there. And now we don't have the support we need to actually be successful. So when we have volitional formations or choices and decisions that are tainted with craving and clinging, then we're not making wholesome decisions that are free of the unwholesome qualities of something like craving. Where if we make our decisions through the wholesome roots of generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom, still progressing towards acquiring wealth potentially, because there's lots of good things that can come about from having wealth, then when we make decisions with generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom, now when we ultimately say get that promotion, then we have all these people around us that are willing to support us and help us and allow there to be even more success because we didn't tromp all over people because of our own selfish desires and craving. And thank you for that. As a follow-up question, from what I understand is do volitional formations create conditions? It is our decision to remain in craving. So if there's craving in the mind, then someone's making the decision to maintain that. And it is because of oftentimes ignorance is the unknowing of true reality that it's craving desire attachment that's even um, causing the discontentedness. So yes, I see what you're headed towards there with that questioning is that it is our choices that ultimately allow the craving and clinging to exist and it is our choices that ultimately lead to that um, but definitely think of these as two separate things but 
just like it's our decisions to have craving and clinging exist in the mind, it's also our decisions that can eradicate those as well. Okay, so there will be a point where a practitioner can make volition formations without arising conditions. Exactly. You can make decisions without having craving, desire, attachment. That's where even, even someone who's unenlightened um, and they're working on eliminating craving, anger, and ignorance, the, the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots, there can be decisions that as they're awakening their mind, they're making more and more decisions that are free of craving, desire, attachment, that are free of anger, hatred, ill will, that are free of ignorance and unknowing of true reality. Um, and that's how you ultimately get closer and closer to practicing the full path and clearing out all your unwholesome karma is that more and more decisions that you're making are free of the pollutions of mind. Um, so uh, an enlightened being is not going to be making any decisions with any kind of pollutions or craving or the other pollutions. But even an unenlightened being, they're getting better and better at removing any of those conditions from their volitional formations or from their choices so that the way they make more and more decisions and they're kind of clearing out more and more of their life, they start experiencing more and more wholesome results um, because of the decisions they're making. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Jan also has her hand raised. Let's go to her. Thank you, Miranda. Um, thank you, Manol. Your question helped me. Yeah, great um, question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, Teacher David, I just clarify. Um, I think I understand now better uh, because of Manol's question. I. I made a decision that um, I would try to really actively practice feeling loving kindness towards everybody that I meet. And uh, because uh, in the past, if there are people who are making a lot of noise or sound very angry or um, are behaving in a, you know, kind of a, a way that they seem upset, it would shake up the mind a little bit. So I made this decision to try to just hold loving kindness whenever that occurs nearby. And it seems to me that now equanimity is more present in the mind. So mm -hmm. I, I just had a little concern that this is, is this a, a wise practice? Is this a, something I, I would continue with to, to the mind's benefit? Yeah, these are part of the four healthy mental states or the four Brahma Viharas that the Buddha taught of loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity. And these all go together uh, quite well. And they're taught as what's called the Brahma Viharas or these are kind of the abodes. This is where the mind should reside at all times is with loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity um, related to all beings and all of our interactions. So when you have loving kindness and you're practicing that with every person then you know as you get better and better at that using the full path as your guidance with things like right speech right action right livelihood that moral conduct then the mind can be at ease when you come home at night or when you're dozing off to sleep you know that you've treated everybody with loving kindness and compassion and you don't have to be fearful of what you know unwholesome might happen at work or is somebody gossiping about you is somebody telling an untruth about you the longer that you're practicing all of these teachings of the eightfold path and these brahma viharas and others the mind can just be so much at ease this is the peacefulness that comes into the mind because you see that the more and more that you're practicing with all the people around you you see more and more people start interacting with you in wholesome ways and your mind can just be at ease so that's a very wise uh, choice to choose to practice loving kindness towards all beings including this being we call jan sometimes we struggle in practicing loving kindness towards ourself we might feel like we're you know kind of supposed to pour ourselves into other people and somehow that's courageous or that's unselfish but it's it's not wise because we often feel depleted so we've got to have loving kindness and compassion for this being that we are right now first <clears throat> and then by doing that and learning how to have that inner dialogue that's very healthy where we're not diminishing ourselves we're not judging ourselves we're not 
uh, you know, looking down upon this being, then when we learn how to do that with our own inner dialogue, then we have a tendency to be able to do that more easily with other people around us. So it would be very wise to continue down that path. It does not appear we have any other questions at this time, sir. All right, so we'll go to chapter 44. Calm and reflection have part in true wisdom. Monks, these two qualities have part in true wisdom. What two? Calm and reflection. If cultivated, what profit does calm attain? The mind is cultivated. What profit results from a cultivated mind? All craving is abandoned. Monks, if reflection is cultivated, what profit does it attain? Wisdom is cultivated. If wisdom is cultivated, what profit does it attain? All ignorance is abandoned. A mind defiled by craving is not liberated, and wisdom defiled by ignorance on knowing of true reality is not developed. Thus, monks, through the fading away of craving, there is liberation of mind, and through the fading away of ignorance on knowing of true reality, there is liberation by wisdom. All right. Thank you, Miranda. This is another really short but impactful teaching from the Buddha, where he's talking about these two qualities of of calmness and reflection, and then showing you how these produce uh, other results or other benefits. <clears throat> so he talks about this calmness, and when the calmness is uh, developed, then the mind is cultivated, it's well developed. And that calmness is the equanimity that we were talking about previously. By having that calmness, the composure, the evenness of temper, then the craving is abandoned because craving is just the opposite. When there's craving in the mind, you're going to feel this go, 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 go. You want to hurry up and walk down the street. You want to hurry up and get to something. You want to go, 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 go. There's this inner pushing or this pulling towards the objects of your affection. But when you calm down and you just relax and you just realize, hey, it's okay. I can do this just one step at a time. I don't need to go, 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 go. Because when there's craving, the mind feels like it can't be satisfied until it gets the object of its affection. And it feels like once it gets its object of its affection, that's what's ultimately going to create the inner peacefulness, the inner satisfaction, and then it'll be calm then. But what ends up happening is the mind is chasing, 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 go, 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 go. It gets the objects of its affection. It experiences these temporary pleasant feelings, and then it ends up in these painful feelings. So whenever you feel the mind pulling or longing or yearning, chasing after the objects of its affection, you just got to pull it back. You've got to restrain it. You got to bring in this calmness. That's what the Buddhist teaching here is. Bring in this equanimity. Cultivate the mind. That's what's going to abandon the craving. Of course, you need to be doing breathing mindfulness meditation, practicing generosity, all these other things. But it's that calmness, that composure, that evenness of temper, not allowing the mind to control you and push or pull towards the objects of your affection. That's what's going to help you to eliminate the craving. And then when there's this inner reflection, this inward looking eye where you don't just hear something and believe it right away, or you don't just see something and believe it right away, but you learn something and then you start reflecting on it. You start looking inward. You start trying to independently verify this. The Buddha is saying the profit that you obtain here when you do this inner reflection is wisdom. You gain this wisdom. Wisdom is cultivated in the mind. And when you cultivate wisdom, this is how you abandon ignorance. Because you can't just go around believing what everybody tells you because you don't know whether it's true or false. And that's where, excuse me, and that's where, that's where the mind can be shaken up very easily when you don't know what is the truth. Excuse me. When the mind doesn't have wisdom, when there's this ignorance or this unknowing of true reality, the mind isn't quite sure what is true or what is false. But by doing that inner reflection, not just with his teachings, but with everything. If you're at work and somebody brings you some project or some data, you would probably ask, you know, where did this come from? What's the source of this? Um, so you would like to build your confidence in this data or whatever it is that you're looking at. Or if your children come to you 
mommy, daddy, you know, brother, you know, beat me up and did this and did that. Or, you know, somebody bullied me at school or whatever. Instead of getting angry and frustrated where the mind's not calm and, you know, rushing off and talking to the teacher or calling up the teacher and yelling at the teacher for allowing some child to bully your child. Instead, calmness, composure, obviously the child's in front of you, so they're safe. So just talk to them and ask them questions. You know, what happened? How did this occur? You know, what were you doing? What was the other children doing? Where was your teacher during this time? Have you talked with any other people about this? Have you talked with your teacher? Are they aware of this? Okay, now you've got their full story. You've flushed that out. Now talk to the teacher. You know, teacher, you know, I have some questions for you. It seems like there might have been some issues at school today. Are you aware of any issues with my child at school today? And then talk through that calmness and composure, right? So that's what's going to allow you to develop the mind is not just believing what people say, but doing this inner reflection and taking your time and spreading out these conversations. For example, like if you have something where your child comes home and says they were bullied, if you feel this anger arising, that's the wrong time to be calling their teacher and talking to them because it's going to come out in your intention, speech and actions. So you need to restrain the mind. And the way that you learn how to do that is through this inner reflection is that the Buddhist teachings are going to teach you what's going on with the mind and what the unenlightened mind has a tendency to do. And then he's sharing with you how to function as an enlightened being. And here, you know, if you've studied dependent origination and any of the other Buddhist teachings, that you need to abandon craving and you need to abandon ignorance. And the way to do that is to cultivate this wisdom. This wisdom of the Buddhist teachings is going to help you learn how to cultivate wisdom, eradicate ignorance. But then through that wisdom, it's going to also teach you about craving and how to eliminate that. And if you eliminate that, then the hatred or the anger, that other poison, should get eliminated through that with you doing loving kindness meditation and all the other things because anger arises because of craving. So if you eliminate craving and ignorance and you're doing your work in terms of the Eightfold Path with right intention, right speech, right action, and others along with meditation, you should be able to eliminate craving, anger, and ignorance and understanding this through practicing calmness in reflection, right? The way that I talk about this is I talk about how calmness leads to mindfulness or awareness of mind. And awareness of mind leads to concentration or singleness of mind. And having concentration or singleness of mind leads to wisdom, where if you're calm, if you have awareness of mind and you have concentration, you can access wisdom and make wise decisions in your life. But just the opposite is if your mind's uncalm, if it's shaken up and discontent, you're not going to have awareness of mind because the mind is now polluted. And now you're not going to have this concentration where there's singleness of mind and therefore you're not going to be able to access wisdom. And this is why if your mind is shaken up in any one given situation, you might actually start making unwise decisions that make the situation worse. So by maintaining your calmness, then you can have mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, arise wisdom, make wiser and wiser decisions. So the Buddha is guiding you in that in the same way that I typically share, but he's doing that in his own language in the way that he shares it, which is making sure you're practicing calmness and equanimity at all times and getting better and better at that. And then the way that you accomplish that is by having this inner reflection, not believing things, but cultivating wisdom to eradicate ignorance. And that's what's going to ultimately also help you to eradicate this craving. What questions do you guys have on this? Uh, Sarah Manal has her hand raised. Let's go to her. Thanks, Miranda. We have a question from Amina. How can we best confront the go-go nature of modern culture that pressures us to get so much done on a daily basis? Not give in to the pressure. Don't conform to what other people are doing. Even if other people around you are pushing you and pressuring you to do things their way because of their own craving, don't you adopt their cravings to be your cravings because people can't push you to do things. You're only going to do what you're willing and 
uh, able to do. So if you feel people around you pressuring you and pushing you, that's the time to slow down. If, if people around me tried to do that, I would slow down even more than normal. Uh, because if you continue to do what it is that they're wanting you to do and you succumb to the pressure and you conform to what other people are doing, you're just stuck in the rat race. You're just stuck on the hamster wheel, just continuing to go around and around and around and around and around. And when you're done with those 10 tasks, they're going to give you 20 more. And then when you're done with those 20, they're going to give you 40 more because the mind's never satisfied because they have craving. So the only way to get to any kind of peacefulness for you is to not succumb to somebody else's cravings, adopt it as your own. Instead, you just know what is wholesome. You know what is good for your life and you practice non-craving and you work in that direction to slow down and restrain the mind where you see the mind is wanting to go, go, go. You just stop and maybe you delay that activity for a few days and train the mind that it's not going to get the objects of its affection. Uh, thank you, sir. It's not appear we have any more questions at this time. All right. So we'll move on to the next chapter, chapter 45. Um, let's go to Jan to read chapter 45, sir. Thank you, Miranda. The motivation. Monks, an effort should be made to understand. This is discontentedness. This is the cause of discontentedness. This is the elimination of discontentedness. This is the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness. Thus, monks, I have taught you the destination and the path leading to the destination. Whatever should be done, monks, by a compassionate teacher, out of compassion for his disciples, aspiring for their welfare, that I have done for you. These are the feet of trees, monks. These are empty huts. Meditate, monks. Do not be complacent, lest you regret it later. This is my instruction to you. Why is that? Because he is out of the evil one's range. All right. Thank you, Jan. So here, the motivation, the Buddha is essentially sharing the Four Noble Truths, He's doing it in summary form. Essentially, what he's doing is he's pointing to the Four Noble Truths and saying, you know, you should make an effort to understand this because once you understand the Four Noble Truths, when you deeply understand it, you see the truth. You see the, the problem of discontentedness. You see the cause. You see the elimination and the path forward. But it takes time to develop that and cultivate that and understand it. I suggest that if you don't yet understand the Four Noble Truths, to consult with Volume 1, Chapter 4. That's where I share the Four Noble Truths in detail. From there, you can seek help through these online classes, through the Facebook group, personal messages. You can reach out for personal guidance. You can come to the in-person classes and so forth. Any practitioner that's making a serious effort towards the attainment of enlightenment will need to start with the Four Noble Truths and establishing right effort. I'm sorry, establishing right view. Without right view, you wouldn't be able to build anything else on top of that. So it's right view as part of the Four Noble Truths that's going to help you to then build on that foundation from there and beyond. The Buddha is saying, I have taught you the destination. The destination is enlightenment. That's what the destination of this path is. He, reiter he reiterates that multiple times in his teachings that the path isn't to be reborn. The path isn't to get psychic powers. The path isn't to perform miracles and do all these miraculous things. But instead, it's to liberate the mind and get to enlightenment. That's where the peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy is. That's where you eliminate the cycle of rebirth. That's what this path is for. And you can see that yourself as the discontentedness is gradually diminishing, that you're working in that direction. So he taught the destination and he taught the path leading to the destination. The path is the Eightfold Path. That's the actual path. So a practitioner not only needs the Four Noble Truths, but they need to know the Eightfold Path backwards, forwards, left, right, up, down, like the back of your hand. And then he explains that, you know, everything that he does, everything that he teaches is out of compassion for his students, aspiring for their welfare. Because by the time someone gets to enlightenment, there's no more craving. There's nothing that they, a person would want or desire or crave or long or yearn for. Their only interest is to continue to live this peaceful and harmonious life that they've uh, now worked so hard to accomplish for themselves 
they're now just going to live that life and just enjoy that life. A Buddha is going above and beyond that. And not only is their mind peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, but they've accomplished this on their own without the help of any other people. So therefore now they're dedicating the rest of their life to share these teachings to help other people. So a Buddha is going to have this deep compassion for his students and for the entire world. And that's why a Buddha dedicates the rest of their life to sharing the teachings with others so that these teachings can then permeate in the world and more and more people can experience the enlightened mental state where it's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, no longer experiencing discontentedness. And then of course, he's pointing to meditation and he's saying, you know, this is kind of where you need to head. And of course, it's not just meditation that's going to lead to enlightenment. There's lots of other things. But if somebody isn't meditating, then they're not really making a concerted effort to get to enlightenment. And that might just be where they're at right now in their practice. But to really see the most progress, you would need two to three meditation sessions of 30 minutes or more. That's what's going to ultimately propel you to enlightenment, along with all the other teachings of the Eightfold Path. And then by training the mind in this way, the Buddha is saying that, okay, you're out of the range of the evil one. Once the mind gets into the jhanas, which are those four preliminary phases that the mind goes through before it gets to the first stage of enlightenment, the mind is now out of the range of Mara, meaning Mara, this, <clears throat> this being that is only interested in producing unwholesomeness in the world, you can no longer be influenced by that being. When you're not yet in the jhanas, even when you're on the path and certainly when you're off the path, Mara can really get into the mind and Mara can kind of influence you. It's still your decisions. Mara is not making the decisions for you, uh, but you're easily influenced potentially when your mind is not well developed. But by developing the mind on the Eightfold Path with all the other teachings and getting into those four preliminary phases of the jhanas, now Mara can't influence you because you know right from wrong. You have developed these teachings to a certain degree that you're now experiencing the jhanas. Mara can't impact you and affect you. But remember, those jhanas, the mind can easily regress out of those. It's not a permanent mental state. So even if you start moving into the jhanas, Usually the difference between the jhanas is night and day between what you've experienced in other parts of your life and experiencing the jhanas. And oftentimes people can get complacent when they're experiencing the jhanas. And it's really important to keep your mind focused on the 10 fetters, continuing to eliminate the 10 fetters rather than allowing the mind to become complacent. Because even though Mara can't influence you when you're in the jhanas, if you decide to be complacent, the mind can regress out of the jhanas and now Mara can influence you. You don't have to be scared or fearful of this being of Mara, but it's important to understand that that influence is there and your goal would be to progress through the jhanas, getting to the first stage of enlightenment, where then the mind can't regress out of that. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear we have any questions at this time, sir. All right, so we'll go to today's last chapter, chapter 46. Okay, let's go to an all to read chapter 46. Thanks, Miranda. To Tathagata's final passing. Monks, for this reason, those matters which I have discovered and proclaimed should be thoroughly learned by you, practiced, developed, and cultivated so that this holy life may endure for a long time, that it may be for the benefit and peacefulness of the multitude, many people, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and peacefulness of heavenly beings and humans. And what are those matters? They are the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right efforts, the four bases of mental power, the five spiritual faculties, the five mental powers, the seven factors of enlightenment, the noble eightfold path. And now monks, I declare to you, all conditioned things are of a nature to decay, strive on untiringly. The Tathagata's final passing will not be long delayed. Three months from now, the Tathagata will take his final Nibbana, final enlightenment. Right by him in years, my lifespan's determined. Now I grow from you, having made myself my refuge. 
Monks, be untiring, mindful, disciplined, guarding your minds and well-collected thought. He who tirelessly keeps to the guidance and teachings, leaving birth behind, will put an end to sorrow and despair. Excellent. Thank you, Manol. So here, the Buddha is giving a heads up that he's going to die in three months. And he's basically helping people to understand, you know, here's kind of the core and foundational teachings that he recommends people focus on as part of uh, progressing to enlightenment. Uh, and one of the myths that we see in the Buddhist community is some people say that the Buddha died from food poisoning, that he ate a poisonous sandwich because he knew that the sandwich was poisonous and he ate it so that somebody else wouldn't eat it. And then he died from that. This is a myth because if you knew a sandwich was poisonous and somebody else was going to eat it, what would you do? You'd probably throw it away, right? Uh, well, here's this wise, enlightened being that shared these teachings so detailed. He's not going to eat a poisonous sandwich. He's going to throw it away if that was the case. But in reality, what it really truly happened is he knew three months ahead of time that he was going to die. And he was giving a heads up to his students of this. And this is very wise of a Buddha because by the time a Buddha has taught throughout their life and they're getting ready to die, they would have thousands and thousands of students. And it's important to give them a heads up so that they have some time to get any remaining questions asked. Because an enlightened being, their mind isn't diminishing as they age. Oftentimes we associate aging with the diminishing of wisdom or diminishing of memory or di <clears throat> diminishing of the qualities of mind. But an enlightened being isn't going to experience that because they've cultivated their mind at whatever point in their life they've gotten to enlightenment. And now even as the physical body ages and maybe the sight deteriorates, the hearing deteriorates, the smell, the taste, other faculties deteriorate with the physical body because they're impermanent, the mind of an enlightened being doesn't deteriorate. So even as their physical body ages, they're not going to experience things like dementia or lack of memory or lack of focus or concentration and things like this. An enlightened being is going to still have those qualities even as they age. So this is an opportunity by him telling people he's going to die in three months that they could ask questions. And this is how enlightened the Buddha was, is that he knew three months in advance of when he was going to die. And he knew the exact moment because he actually delivers his last teaching. And then he actually died right then. He, he shared his, his actual words. So he knew the exact moment. And then he spoke his last words and he passed away. So here he's just kind of giving them encouragement, giving them motivation, giving them a heads up, and also sharing the teachings that he feels are the most important for someone to be able to focus on in order to get to enlightenment. And I've shared something along these lines as well in the book series that I wrote. If you look in volume one, I give you seven or eight things to focus on as foundational teachings in order to progress to enlightenment. So you'll see those and those teachings are actually shared in volume one. Uh, and then further explained through the words of the Buddha throughout the rest of the book series and throughout these classes. So what questions do you guys have on this chapter? Manal has her hand raised. Let's go to her, sir. Thank you, Brenda. Teacher David, not uh, related to any of our chapters today, uh, but if you should have time, Amina is inquiring about um, any brief updates for the, what is the, uh, the retreat that's happening currently. Yeah, so a lot of us are starting to gather here in Arlington. Miranda and Manal are here. I uh, just met them a little while ago. And uh, we're going to be starting tomorrow at 3 p.m. East Coast time. And then it goes until Friday at 3 p.m. East Coast time. Uh, everything's happening here. Uh, I'm not planning to do any recording or live streaming of the classes. Um, I think it would be kind of too much going on in the room and too much technology involved. Uh, maybe someday in the future when there's more support, we might be able to hire a team or we might have volunteers in our community that can set up some cameras and do the live streaming part. But with me doing all the teaching and other things, I'm just going to focus on doing that and then I just know that someday in the future, there'll probably be the ability to do live streaming of these kind of retreats and stuff. What I'm planning to do is in the retreat is the first day and a half are uh, teachings that I shared in other formats of the group learning program and stuff like that. So 
We're going to be learning the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, and things like this, because about 90%, 80 or 90% of the people that are planning to come are brand new students. So we have that day and a half to kind of build the foundation. And then the other three and a half days is all new content that I've never taught any where else in new classes. So I'm going to teach it here in the retreat. And then my thought is that I will then share that online starting around October, November. At the end of this iteration of the group learning program, there's about eight classes that are going to be brand new in this retreat. And I figured that what I would do is I would teach those online so that we can get recordings of those and people who didn't attend the retreats will be able to learn that same content, those same teachings uh, online. So uh, I'm here, Miranda's here, Manal's here, Nick's gonna be dropping off some stuff today. And there's other people, Aaron is gonna be coming, and other folks, uh, you're welcome to come. I think you're in Italy right now. so. Amina probably isn't going to be able to make it, but if there's anyone who's out there and in the Washington, D.C. area or would like to travel here, you're welcome to come to any of the sessions Sunday through Friday. And we're going to be learning in the morning for about three hours. And then we have a, a kind of excursions or free time that we've built into the program. And then we've got a couple of hours in the evening where there's some more learning and some more uh, teaching as well. And uh, by the time somebody learns in this retreat, they will have really uh, soaked their feet into the teachings uh, really deeply and uh, emerge with a lot more wisdom about the Buddhist teachings. And it's a great time to get together with other people who are learning and practicing and building community and uh, interacting with people who are on the path. That's a really nice benefit of meeting in person and having these retreats is you get to interact with people and kind of rather than just being at home online or just being you know doing your meditations on your own you get to kind of interact with people and like oh i like how miranda did that or oh that was really wise how manal handled that situation with the waiter you know i like that i'll go incorporate that into my practice so this is one of the things that you can do by being around other people who are uh, working towards enlightenment is you can glean benefit by being in in and amongst the community of observing how people practice the teachings in different situations and then bring that into your own practice. It does not appear there are any other questions at this time, sir. All right. Well, we just had a few, you know, six chapters there, just kind of a short class compared to what we normally have with the 10 chapters and the chapters themselves were pretty short. So I'm just going to say goodbye to you guys by sharing with you what we're going to be doing in our future classes. Tomorrow is the group learning program, which I'll be teaching online as well. It's chapter eight titled Craving, Anger, and Ignorance, The Three Poisons, or the, the actual title is The Three Poison, Transforming the Three Poisons, Craving, Anger, and Ignorance. And I'll be teaching that at the same time, uh, which based on the Thai time zone is uh, Sunday at 9 p.m. Thai time. So you're welcome to join for that. And that's chapter eight in volume one. If, if you read that either before and or after class, you'll gain some more insight about what that is. Because for me, in writing this book and working with this book and helping students to learn the teachings of the Buddha, it seems like when they're first going through the first several chapters, they're kind of getting their bearings about what the Buddhist teachings are. And when you get to chapter eight, it's almost like the light bulbs start going off. If you've ever watched Karate Kid, it's almost like the, the Mr. Miyagi moment where you've been doing all this stuff, you've been doing all this meditation, you've been learning the AFO path and all this stuff. And it's like, am I really learning how to get to enlightenment? And then your teacher comes in and like, yeah, and here's why. Here's the three poisons and here's how all that stuff you've been doing has been leading up to eliminating these three poisons so just like the karate kid you know washing the cars waxing on waxing off painting the fence he didn't think he was learning karate and then eventually mr miyagi was like oh you've been learning karate all right let me show you and it's the same thing with these teachings of the buddha is that as you're learning these teachings when you learn the three poisons it's like oh yeah so this is what all of that stuff leads to is the elimination of these and here's why so if you haven't read that chapter yet or you haven't participated in that class or even if you have to refresh that will be really helpful for you so i'm going to be doing that tomorrow and then on wednesday bossom is going to be teaching the fourth 
class of the four-part series on Buddhist chanting. It's going to be a Zoom-only class. These Wednesday classes while I'm traveling is going to be Zoom-only. So Bassam is going to be doing three classes and Miranda is going to be doing three. So you're welcome to join. There just isn't live streaming on those. And there isn't going to be any YouTube videos or Facebook videos or even a podcast on the Wednesday classes because we're just building the ability up for different people to be teaching. But you can always participate in those classes by Zoom live. And then if you're usually listening to the replays, you can always go back and listen to versions of those classes that I've taught either on Facebook, YouTube, or the podcast. You can see where I've taught those exact same classes and recorded them in the past. And then next week in the Saturday class, the Pali Canon and English Study Group, I will no longer be in Arlington. Oh, no, I will be in Arlington, actually. I'll still be in Arlington then. And I'll be teaching uh, volume 11, chapters 1 through 10. So we'll be learning the Pali Canon and English Study Group, volume 11, chapters 1 through 10. So if you'd like to join, you might decide to read those prior to class. So thank you all for participating in the class. Thank you for your questions and your diligent and dedicated study outside of class and applying these teachings in your life. I'd like to thank you all for your support and helping me to be able to host this retreat for those students who are coming here to learn, whether you're actually going to be here and attending and actually participating or whether you've just been supporting me along the way and helping me get to the point where now I can offer these teachings in a live environment here in the U.S. rather than just a live environment in Chiang Mai, Thailand. So thank you all for your support and everything that you do to help bring these teachings into the world including and especially including developing your own practice. So thank you so much. We'll see you in a future class. Have a very lovely day. Sawadee khap. again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.